Welcome, everyone, uh, again. Uh, in our next talk, we have Chris. Uh, I've known about Chris for about three and a half years, and the main reason I know Chris is because he has one of the best courses out there on deploying machine learning models in, on Udemy, one of the most successful courses. I think he has about, I checked the, um, the details this morning, about 30,000, 35,000 students uh, about more than 5,000 currently undergoing the course right now. I was one of those students. I still go to the course very regularly because they keep updating it all the time. I don't know where you find the time, <laughs> seriously, uh, but it's still very up to date uh, and they keep adding more stuff. So it, it just keeps on getting better. And anyhow, Chris is now uh, working on a few new things since he's the CTO of his own company. And uh, I'm going to let him speak a little bit more about it, but he has a very hands-on um, talk for today, and I'm, and I'm super excited. And so please, everyone, help me in welcoming Chris. Thanks, Ramon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about building AI applications with open source models. So to begin, I'd like you to cast your mind back to this time about a year ago. Uh, if you're really honest with yourself, certainly uh, when I think about from my perspective, back in January of 2023, I wasn't really expecting to run an LLM on my own laptop. Uh, that seemed pretty far out of reach, uh, only for the GPU rich. Um, and yet, if we look at the timeline, February 2023, Meta releases Llama, which is actually a pretty good open source model. And then in March of 2023, Kyogi Gaganov uh, brought out Llama CPP, and then you could run Llama on your MacBook. So that was a huge step forward. More time goes by. We think to July of 2023, Llama 2 is released, and this is actually a pretty decent open source model. Fast forward to December, and a small French startup releases a model that outperforms GPT 3.5 and is better than Google's flagship model. Now, I know Google's been scrambling, so maybe as of a few days ago, that may have changed, but that was a major step as well because it meant that really you had uh, an impressive open source option to go to. And now you've got people like Simon Wilson running LLMs on their iPhones, on a Raspberry Pi. So I think the word awesome gets thrown around too often, but this is awesome. A lot has changed in the past year. This talk is going to be an Ubuntu length beard talk. Um, by, by show of hands, who here has run an LLM, like done inference on their laptop, not using a third party API? Few few hands, maybe 20% of people here. Okay, cool. So every now and then we'll dip into some Debian beard length stuff, but mostly Ubuntu length. Uh, it's going to be quite a broad talk. I'm going to cover quite a lot of interesting stuff, but maybe not in super depth, but with enough detail and enough hands-on code that you'll get ideas and hopefully be able to help you in your own projects and using these models on your own machines. Uh, I'll quickly talk about AI engineering and some background on LLMs. I think most people here will know some of that, but maybe there'll be a few curveballs. And then we'll do some hands-on stuff with Llama CPP. I'll give you an introduction to that. We'll ratchet up the complexity and we'll go to retrieval augmented generation with Llama index. It's also using open source models, right? This is the, the sort of crux of the talk. And then I've got some fun stuff about how to evaluate the results from your LLMs locally. I think this might be one of the really interesting use cases for these open source um, LLMs. And then some pithy thoughts at the end about indie hacking for the GPU pool. I'm not going to talk about fine tuning or training because I don't know very much about them. So then ask me about them in the Q&A. And I'm not going to talk about deployment because I don't think we have time. I'm still figuring out a lot of stuff with the deployment of this. And I think Ramon is going to be talking about some of that as well. I like this quote because Simon Wilson calls it a new kind of software, and it does feel like that at times. Um, the amount of non-determinism you're dealing with, uh, the sort of number of edge cases you have to start to consider, 
uh, it does make it feel like quite a new paradigm, which is fascinating, but also brings plenty of new challenges. I think this is interesting too, that Carpathy reckons that there'll be more AI engineers than ML or LLM engineers. And Sean Wang, who runs the Latent Space podcast, which is excellent, we're gonna look at some of their transcripts in this talk, um, reckons that flippening, where AI engineers outnumber ML engineers happens in about five years. I think that's pretty conservative. Here's, you know, what is an AI engineer? Like, here's a good diagram to kind of conceptualize it. Mostly dealing with chains and agents, tooling and infra. I mean, this, this line is permeable. They're, you know, we'll shift back and forth across it. And that goes for both sides. Um, and so I, I think it's fair to say that just as site reliability engineer, DevOps engineer, data engineer, developed as sub-disciplines because obviously it's it's all software engineering, right? As the long beards will tell us. But okay, but there's still enough specific knowledge here uh, that takes a lot of time to get a feel for, thinking about all the models, all the tools, but I think it will develop to be its own significant sub-discipline. I think lots of people here already know the answer to this question, but what I want to capture is the fact that an LLM, once you've done all your training and you've got your parameter file and you've got your run file, it's basically two files that then you can run on your machine as a self-contained environment. And so sometimes people don't quite have this mental model of it. Now, obviously, the training part is incredibly compute intensive, takes tens of millions of dollars for top of the range models. Um, and takes a lot of time as well. But once you've got there, it basically boils down to this. And the creation stages to recap, you've got your generative pre-training. This is the really expensive, really hard bit. Uh, you've got your supervised learning and reinforcement learning through human feedback. Fine tuning, which is getting more approachable, but still requires pretty decent ML understanding. Still requires a fair amount of GPU. And then once you get to chaining, from creation and operation, then this is the realm where it's kind of easier to work with. And this is the stuff we'll be we're looking at in this talk. The idea here is this is how you build stuff. Um, and this is all actually uh, quite approachable. Um, this is from the chatbot model arena leaderboard, which I think is the, the main one people are using at the moment to, to rank these. You've got your GPT-4 in the top spot, and then you've got the uh, Claude models from Anthropic. Um, and then in comes Mixtral at number six. I don't know, if this, I got this screenshot a couple of weeks ago. It may be slightly out of date now, but you get the gist, right? Like open source model, Apache 2 uh, license, very permissive, that is very good. This is a big deal. Which all begs the question, how is this even possible? Um, three main reasons. You've got highly optimized C, C++, code for doing your efficient inference. You've got uh, optimization to run on consumer-grade hardware. So Llama CPP, uh, in, it, it, you can use the GPUs. It's configured to use it. It's obviously faster to do that. But it will run on CPU as well. Um, so on Apple devices, it leverages the Metal API for direct GPU access. Uh, and then quantization, which is the process where you reduce the model weights without the size of the model weights without the significant loss in performance. Um, so yeah, that's how it's done. We'll skip that, that's Debian beard length. Uh, this is a screenshot from Hugging Face, just showing the sort of range. This is for the mixture model, so one of the most compute intensive if you want to run it on your local machine. I'm also going to show you the Tiny Llama model, which is will run, I think, on most laptops that aren't more than like eight years old, say. Uh, but this is also part of the art and science when you're evaluating these different models is like, it's always the trade-off between quantization and uh, resource requirements and hence inference speed, right? You're always dealing with this trade-off. Okay, let's get into it. Yes, shout out to JetBrains. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm going to start off with 
this LLM script. Can everybody see that all right? It's pretty big, right? Should be okay. Shout if you can't. Uh, and I'm going to kick this off because it takes about a minute to run. What we've got here is the Llama class, uh, which is from the Llama CPP Python bindings library. Um, and you pass into it your GGUF um, model, which you download from uh, Hugging Space. So I've got my downloaded models here in this data directory. There's the GGUF file. Um, you specify your end context, so the context window you're going to be working with. That is both the input and the output combined, right? So your, your prompt and the outputs uh, need to fit in that context. And one of the really cool things about the mixture model is that it's got more than 100,000 token context uh, window length, which means that you can throw at it like entire transcripts of podcasts and stuff like that, which is great. Um, if you want to enable GPU usage on your laptop, you set the NGPU layers to one or more. If not, and you want to run on CPU, you set it to zero. A little gotcha is you want to set the chat format. It's Llama 2 by default, but when you're on Hugging Face, uh, hopefully people have, have had a, a look on Hugging Face, but typically there will be a prompt template. And um, usually it's pretty self-explanatory, sometimes not. Uh, some gotchas here. This isn't very well documented, but if you go to the Llama CPP Python bindings, there's this notion of the, uh, let's scroll down and find some examples. I presume they will document this soon, but where, where it has the decorated a register chat format, then you need to find the one that lines up with your model, right? So sometimes a little bit of detective work involved, but it's all doable. Um, I've got these three prompts lined up that I've run. How are you? What is the capital of Spain? And on a scale of one to 10, how good is Blade Runner 2049? Damn right. And the answers to these questions, what we're getting from Tiny Llama, I'm fine, but I need some time to think of a good answer, Java. <laughs> So this gives you a feel for some of the strange behavior of the smaller models, right? Tiny Llama is like a billion parameters, so pretty small. The mixture, I'm an artificial intelligence, I don't have feelings. He tends to waffle on a bit, or, or he or she. Um, it's the capital, what is the capital of Spain? Capital of Spain is Madrid. Well done, Tiny. It gets that wrong about 50% of the time. It threw Malaga at me earlier today. Uh, and then make sure the campus is Madrid. And then it waffles on. Um, it's a bit of a show off, to be honest. But in its defense, I didn't, in my prompt, say, be concise. So yeah, I get it. And then Tiny's come out with a very truthful answer. So well, well done, Tiny. And Mixture again, kind of shows off and says, like, well, you know, I've got 87% on. Uh, different sites, eight out of 10, Metacritic, you know, you, you get the idea. Like it's, make, make sure kind of backs things up with some, some facts and knowledge. So let's just back up a bit to see how some of this uh, worked, because I, I did gloss over that a little bit. Um, yeah, when this run LLM uh, function, I've given it a system prompt, and it's quite a similar syntax uh, to maybe what you're used to with like the OpenAI API. Um, give it a temperature for the amount of creativity. And then here's where stuff that a lot of um, very knowledgeable people don't know about that I think is really, really useful. This is the notion of formal grammars in the output of these models. So let's, let me show you where this is in... Uh... Llama CPP, yeah, this is the notion of formal grammars. And the, the files for these grammars are GBNF, which is Bacchus now a form. Um, but the crux here is that 
you can force the output to be in a particular format, be it JSON, XML, HTML, no more praying that your model is smart enough to understand your prompt. Um, so this is super powerful and super useful. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to this library that I found called the Swiss Army Llama by uh, this chap, Jeff Emanuel. This is a criminally underrated uh, resource that you should definitely check out because amongst many other things he has in here, uh, a, a grammar generator of a pedantic schema. So you can define uh, a pedantic schema and it will output a valid grammar that you can then plug into your open source model to guarantee an output in a particular format, right? So super powerful stuff that will save you enormous amounts of headache. Um, and I'm going to show you how that's useful uh, a bit later when we look at the evaluation stuff. Um, anything else we want to chat about on this? Now let's crack on. Cool. Uh, retrieval augmented generation. Um, there are lots of great talks about this out there. Uh, I'm going to just very briefly explain what it is for, I'm, I'm sure most of you know already, uh, but in a nutshell, it's the difference between an open book test and a closed book test. These large language models are trained on huge amounts of public data on the internet, but they're not trained on your private or your company's proprietary data. So if you want these models to tell you things that involve knowing those bits of private information, um, you need to set up something like a RAG pipeline. So roughly speaking, you take your proprietary data, you embed it, the process of embedding uh, into a storage mechanism, typically a vector database. Um, and then when queries come in, there's a retrieval process, which is where um, during the process of embedding, you get these vector arrays uh, of multidimensional length. And based on those vector uh, those arrays, you can determine the similarity of certain bits of text and semantic meaning. So your retrieval system will fetch whatever the most relevant bits of data from your proprietary system is, and then inject that into your prompt. So RAG is basically a massive hack. It is a advanced form of prompt engineering. Um, and I'm not butchering that. That's a quote from Jerry Liu, who made Llama Index. He's also referred to RAG as a hack. Uh, so that's what's going on there. And I, I glossed over a lot of the details. Everybody gets really annoyed with these sorts of diagrams because it's like, where's the embedding step? But you know, I mentioned it. Um, and we're going to talk about the embedding open source models that you can also plug in and why that might be a good idea. Yes, time to look at Llama Index. Uh, for people who don't know, this is Llama Index, and it's a data framework for basically doing RAG. I really like it. I like it a lot more than Langchain. Um, and it's quite intuitive. Let's check it out. OK, again, I'm going to kick off this RAG job because it takes about a minute to run. And what we have this time around is a series of prompts. So you're a bot that answers questions about podcast transcripts. And the, the podcast transcript in question here is this one, which is episode 44 of the Latent Space podcast. Really great episodes, really great podcast as well about AI engineering. This is where they interview Dylan Patel from Semi Analysis, who does a lot of great hardware um, analysis. And there's a bit here that we're going to come to um, when we're checking out our RAG output, where he talks about how the semiconductor supply chain is um, fragmented and there's a lot of monopolies, right? So, you know, bookmark that because we'll, we'll be looking for that. So the question in my prompt is, according to Dylan Patel, uh, what don't people understand about the semiconductor supply chain? And we're going to look at the answer from the no RAG result and the answer from with RAG result. So let's see if that's finished running. It has not. So we're going to explain the code some more whilst, whilst that's running. Uh, if we look at the run inference function, some things you need to do in Llama index. Uh, we instantiate our LLM. 
and a little gotcha here, this actually tripped me up the first time I tried to do it, that class is not the one from Llama CPP. It's a separate class from Llama index, so don't make that mistake. Um, and then loading the embedding model, so we're pulling one down from uh, Hugging Face. And I know what you're thinking, like, but the embedding APIs are so cheap, why would you bother? Well, OpenAI has just deprecated their older family, older versions of their embedding API. If you had indexed a large amount of data um, and you wanted to keep using that, you'd now be having to re-index all that data, which is a very potentially like large job. So there are certain advantages to being able to use an open source model for embedding. Um, for Llama index, you've got to set the global tokenizer. Then Llama index has this notion of a service context, and you can pass into it your LLM and your embedding model. Recall, these are both open source models running on this laptop. No API calls are occurring, apart from maybe that cheeky initial hugging face one, but you get the idea. Um, and then the system prompt is you're a bot that answers questions about a podcast transcript. Um, I'm going to show you the save and load index bit in a second. Let's just uh, pull up. Yeah, this is done now. So here's our no rag result. Dylan Patel, in his podcast, The Daily Semi, mentioned that one common misconception about the semiconductor supply chain is this starts with a foundry or wafer fabrication plant, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there's no such thing as the daily semi. This is a hallucination by the model. And it hasn't talked about fragmentation and it hasn't talked about monopolies. I mean, it sounds pretty good, right? But like, it's a lie and it's wrong. Uh, and then the RAG result immediately Fragmentation of the supply chain, how many monopolies they are. This is correct, right? So this is a, an illustration of the value add that you get with RAG. Also quite a nice um, hallucination. I like it when they come up with entirely fabricated podcasts. And we'll talk about how to tackle that in the, uh, the evaluation bit. Okay. Going back up to here. So how, how did that work exactly? A, a lot of stuff went on in the save or load index function here. Um, Llama index offers this storage context. Uh, so if it finds index, in this case, it's just like local files, right? If, if we expand this out and go to indices, this is basically my very super simple file-based index. In production, of course, you'd use a vector database. Um, there's a huge race going on right now amongst AI startups to create different uh, vector databases. But don't forget, I'd like to point out, there's always PG vector, so you can just stick with Postgres. Um, obviously, depends on your use case and do your benchmarking, but like, uh, I really subscribe to innovation tokens and not complicating your stack unnecessarily. Uh, anyway, going back to here, we've got the simple directory reader that uh, finds that index. We, from those documents, create our vector store index, and we persist it. This is if it doesn't exist, All right? So basically, the, this is what, like a dozen lines of code to uh, either load or persist our index and generate a simple RAG pipeline. OK, it's just a, sim a single document in this case, but you could extrapolate this to large amounts of documents. And Llama index has a huge wealth of data connectors to pull in information from Slack, databases, what, data lakes, like you name it, um, Google Docs, Google Drive. So you can really go nuts. Okay. Next up, let's talk about uh, evaluating a little bit because the difference between playing around and getting something ready for production will be in your evaluation approach. For this, I'm going to show you a an open source library called Deep Eval.
DeepEval is made by Confident AI. They're a AI tooling startup, and they've open sourced this. I don't have any affiliation with them, but I like it because it integrates with PyCharm, uh, sorry, with PyTest really nicely. Um, this is the sort of syntax you get for testing. And yeah, you can just drop it into PyTest and it will run with your existing test suite. So really nice in that sense. Uh, I'm going to show you an example, a couple tests using this um, testing tool. So again, I'm going to kick this off because it takes about a minute. And whilst that's running, I'll show you the, the sorts of uh, tests that I'm running. So I've got a parameterized test here. You can see that it, it works with PyTest as you'd expect. Um, I pull in the transcript for this podcast episode that we were just working with. Uh, it's actually like a shortened version of it because I don't want this test to take too long. And then once I've loaded that, I have this notion of an LLM test case, and I have a, a prompt. The actual output is what my local LLM has, has just created, right? So it's, again, a Llama CPP um, instantiated model, and that's what gets passed into the actual output, the inference from that local model. And I tell it, I expect the output to be the fragmented nature of the supply chain and existing monopolies, right? The, the stuff that we were just looking at uh, with RAG. And then I set up my tests like this. There's, this is a G eval test. This is an example of a really general test. So super versatile. You basically just define the evaluation steps in free text. Determine if the actual output contains the key insights from the input transcription. You, you could write any sort of question about your data that you had here. Um, and that's what it will test against. You give it a, a threshold, it sort of generates a score as to how closely it thinks you have come in, in this test. Uh, and then we also have this hallucination metric, which looks for hallucinations in your output. And then this code here is just me logging stuff to a file so that I can show you guys. So let's have a look at the output. So here are our two tests. Insights, we got a score of 0 0.9, so very good. Hallucination, pretty good score. So maybe it thinks it's found some hallucination in there. And the test you can see has also passed now. Um, whilst I want to show you also uh, the deep eval system um, from Confident AI, because I think that's pretty cool. And also, I bothered the founder of um, Confident AI, Jeffrey Ip, to help me use a, a Llama CPP model rather than an Olama model, because I didn't want to have two different frameworks. Um, and he fixed that over the weekend. So like, they're super responsive. Shout out to Jeffrey. Thanks for doing that. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in here. Custom evaluation model. It needed the grammar, right? This was an interesting example of where the, the problem, the reason why when I passed in a locally running model uh, was that the model was too stupid to correctly output the JSON, which the framework expected, right? So these are new types of problems, um, but grammar solves that. So if you are able to use grammars, then it can help you navigate around some of these like quite alien challenges that you wouldn't usually get in a in a typical like software challenge. Uh, this is Confident AI showing me a, a dashboard for the um, the tests that I've just run. You can view it as JSON. So it's, it's a nice sort of dashboard of, of your tests. And I'm just scratching the surface as well of the um, tests that they offer. You've got stuff like summarization, uh, and then a whole load of tests for your RAG pipeline as well. Uh, in fact, this, this really is a tool primarily targeted at RAG pipeline. So faithfulness of your, your RAG pipeline, contextual recall, as well as stuff like toxicity. Um, and you can define custom metrics and the like. So um, 
my point here is not to say that, you know, the tools that I've been showing you, be it Llama Index or Llama CPP or DeepEval, that like these are the tools. The point is to say, this is the sort of thing you can be doing and how to think about it. And um, I think this is really exciting. And for, for testing specifically, being able to use an open source model and run it on your laptop means you don't have to pay to run your test suite. Nobody wants to pay to run their tests. Like, that is annoying. So this, I think, is going to be a really good reason for more people to start looking at these open source models. OK, a few thoughts. How am I for time? OK, uh, a few thoughts on indie hacking for the GPU poor. We're going to see a lot of uh, data engineering happening over the next few years. Good time to be a data engineer, I reckon. Um, but stuff of this complexity isn't actually necessary to make cool stuff. I think when you think about the sort of control complexity trade-off, this point is quite interesting, where you can basically do a load of offline ETL jobs using LLMs um, for data generation to build these really cool data-enabled applications, just web apps, but with super useful information um, which where you can crunch it in a way that you never could before you had an LLM, at least not without a very large team and a lot of work. Um, so I think that's interesting. And so I think some other trends we'll see lots of offline ETL jobs. Uh, I don't know if anybody's coined this yet, but I'm going to try and coin it. I think the graceful degradation when it applies to models. In uh, the front end world, they used to talk a lot about graceful degradation when you're going from like one browser to another and one browser supports like more features, so your page looks good. If you gracefully degrade, functionality is still there, but it doesn't look as fancy. I think we'll start to see some of that with models where like if you're a user hogging too much inference time, maybe you get downgraded to a, a, a model that requires less, less extreme hardware. And then UI will support that as well, constraining prompt length to make inference more manageable. Um, doing a bunch of async processing, so telling users like, hey, we'll email you the results, or like, hey, come back in 10 minutes, this is processing in the background. And yeah, putting the more expensive inference behind paywalls and um, logins. This is one that I've just started whipping up, but I thought I'd throw in as a, just a quick, Example, I suck at design, by the way. Um, yeah. These are all the Indie and Hacker Podcast transcripts online. crunched okay. to give you the top 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 four now. insights. I'm just looking at the end part of it uh, now. And I just remembered now. Oh, shit. All the <sighs> like business category, industry. Okay, none premium, that's weird. I remember with all these activities. Marketplace, there's some of them. Like... All these categories are just hmm? figured out by the LLM if you give I it a good like... prompt, right? So I, I think we're going to see a massive boom in solopreneurship, indie hacking really? from those who are inclined to um, get to grips with these tools. Like I said before, my, my point here is not that like the tools I've showed you are the best tools. They're just the tools that I've started using. Um, but you can also check out the LLM. There's Olama, and for more of like a, a desktop type app, there's LM Studio. And uh, I've only very briefly touched Olama, so don't ask me in the Q&A which one's better. I don't know. And I think not many people actually know. Like this is a race right now for all these tooling companies to say, you know, to, to win the, the top spot, to be the go-to. I'd say that Llama Index is doing very well in that department for um, RAG. Their documentation is incredible. I've got one more slide after this with a thought-provoking quote, but I wanted to make sure I didn't forget my plug, which is, that's my site. I will send out these slides and some really useful code snippets in my newsletter this week, so please subscribe.
So to close, this is from Andre Carpathy's uh, intro to LLM talk, which is really, really good, as is everything the guy does. Um, the power of LLMs lies in two variables, the number of parameters n and the volume of training text d. As these increase, so does the model's effectiveness. And there's no sign that this is topping out or that we're reaching any kind of ceiling. Right? So cast your mind back to the, the first timeline that I showed you about everything that's happened in the past year, factor in the fact that we don't appear to be topping out or hitting any kind of ceiling. In fact, we can just keep throwing compute at this problem and these models will just keep getting better. And um, we've got some very exciting times ahead. So thanks for listening. Let's go to Q&A. Fantastic. Talk. I am pretty confident that everybody here agrees with me. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, anybody has any questions? All right, let me see. Yep, this way. Um, that was such an amazing talk. Um, so one question I had is with regards to your Kapathy quote in the last slide. So of course we can make the models bigger and bigger, but do you think we're going to start hitting limitations on the machines to actually run them? Because I feel like we're actually already running into that. Ooh. Well, I definitely recommend checking out that episode 44 of the Latent Space podcast, because they then have the whole debate about the, the massive divide we're seeing now between the GPU pores and the GPU rich. Um, because, yeah, there's a massive hardware race going on right now. Like you touched on in your talk in the Q&A, there's a sort of race to the bottom with inference pricing happening. Mm -hmm. um, are we going to hit actual like hardware constraints? I don't think so if you're rich. I think if you're poor, then yes, it's going to suck. So like everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I love that. And by the way, I do recommend the Layton podcast. It's fantastic. And there's another one, uh, a really, really good uh, podcast episode in Twimble AI where they interview Sarah Hooker. Um, she wrote the paper, The Hardware Lottery, I think it is, and I highly recommend that one as well. Uh, and let me not take away your time for questions. Do you have a question here? Sorry, Twimo uh, AI, so T-W-I-M-L dot AI. So, so yep. it is not questions, so actually following up the that part for the inner size of the model and also size of the data, then it is written in the probably the original paper, GPT-3 paper, so it's talking about the problem like a GPT-4 thing at least like five, like 2025 version will be like a slightly like hit the plateau or something. So that's the estimation. Ah, so want... there, is a, there is a plateau eventually. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. And that's happening in 2025, they reckon? So this is what they have uh, like it's Okay. Like they have okay. like a weird plot from like page 10 or something, the original plot, but then it's talking about that. Interesting. Um, there was a there was also another comment or another article about um, DeepMind has been training a lot of models and they've been using a lot of synthetic generated data uh, to also feed back into these even larger models. So I wonder, like, what to what extent we'll see models being trained with a big chunk of uh, data generated by humans and then another chunk generated by AI systems and also what the quality of that system will be. But again, any other questions, everyone? Okay, we got a question over here. Please pass it to her. Hi, a very nice talk. Thanks for that. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, you were showing those uh, tests, how to test LLMs. So can you, how do you use those tests to improve LLM? Is it possible to kind of, uh, get any any tangible outputs of the test to to feed them back into the model and, and improve them? Not automatically, but it would be a, a process of iteration, right? So you set the thresholds. Um, you, you saw that with that G eval test, you could actually specify what exactly you're looking for, and it gives you a score, right? So I think your iterative process there would be run the test, see what score you get, and then tweak the prompt, change the RAG system, do something, come back, did that improve the score? And obviously by the score, I mean like a whole battery of tests that you would set up specific for your use case. And I think it's that kind of iterative process is what it would probably end up looking like. 
Yeah, that's fine. So thanks. Uh, if I may, one more question. Please, please, please go. Um, yeah. So, would you recommend using like those open source models with with clients, actual clients, or would you stick to open a open AI? Uh, it depends on the use case, right? So, like, it's hard to make a blanket answer to that cop out, I know. But like, Mixtool's pretty damn good, so maybe, yeah. Um, I, so I think you'd you'd want to do a comparison, what sort of quality you're getting from GPT-4, compare it with what you get from a mixture or something similar, and if it's within an acceptable range, then go for it. Thank you. Awesome. Please help me in thanking Chris again.